Hello, I have the pleasure that Andy Stanford Clark is in the show and Andy is an expert on quantum computing. And Andy, oh, it's so amazing topic. Uh, and it's so cool that you have time just to explain us a little bit about quantum computing and we can talk a little bit about quantum computing. So, sure, it's great to be on the show, thank you. Yeah, what, um, what, 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 yeah exactly, what, what I've understand is, I mean, we have bits, you know, there's a zero and one, and we have qubits, which is, Four. It represents four dimensions. Uh, kind of, yeah. So each qubit, we tend to think it was a we represent a thing called the block sphere, which is like a, a sphere. But you have like a latitude and longitude. So you have an x, y, and z uh, direction. But each of those is a real number. So it's actually kind of four dimensions to play with. Um, and that's when the qubit's in its superposition state. When you look at it, when you want to read out the answer, it, the wave field collapses and it becomes a zero or a one. So you have to run the experiment loads and loads of times to find out, kind of build a frequency distribution of what the what what the quantum computer was thinking before it before you looked at it. Uh, the other effect that we use is entanglement, which means you can link qubits together. Which means that rather than each rep each qubit representing one just one value, um, you can link them all together. So n qubits can represent two to the power of n. Uh, computational states. So, for example, three qubits could represent eight states, 10 qubits could represent 1024 states, and so on. Uh, which means that you rapidly get to the situation where we can see so many permutations and combinations of a problem space, you can search massive combinatorial problems like huge optimization problems or computational chemistry problems for maybe protein folding in the future or uh, designing new chemicals for electric vehicle batteries. Um, lots of lots of possibilities to look at and then work out which is the most optimal by doing an optimization to see which is the lowest energy or the, the, the highest value. And the third effect that we make use of is called interference, which is kind of like ripples on a pond where the when two waves hit, you get a, a peak and where they destructively interfere, you get a zero. And the, the, the trick with quantum algorithms is to make your uh, the correct answer shine out, make it amplify, and make all the incorrect answers decrease by destructive interference. So you end up with a, a fairly flat level and then a peak sticking out, which is, ah, there's the answer. And uh, that is what makes quantum computing so difficult. And for software engineers like me, who think just too classically, uh, it makes it very hard to wrap our heads around that sort of sidelong way look of looking at a problem going, ha ha, that's how we can solve that on a quantum computer. because that requires a new way of thinking. Why we're relying on a new generation of university graduates, even school children thinking less classically to become the quantum programs of the future. Yes, it was even like, I had the pleasure to watch the IBM quantum computer, 50 qubit quantum computer. And I mean, it was looking so different. Yes, it was, I mean, you have all these tubes and electrical wires and stuff. Yeah. It was not, looking like a modern computer to me it was so mechanical but 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 of course i understand that this is uh, just the beginning of the technology so yeah and also that bit you're looking at was actually just the refrigerator so that that <laughs> yes. thing we call the chandelier the beautiful picture is actually chilling you from 40 kelvin down to 0, 15 millikelvin and the the actual quantum computer is in a little tin can at the bottom. It's a chip with the qubits on it. So the, the bit you call mechanical is actually just, it is literally a, a mechanical chiller. The, uh, the box itself, and here, here's, a, here's a model I made earlier, which I'm rather proud of on my 3D printer, um, does actually look rather beautiful, and not unlike a modern computer, except for this yeah. silver tube in the middle, which is the, uh, the cryostat, which is where the super cold bit is. Um, but uh, as you say, it is early days yet and the miniaturization and perhaps being able to work on um, higher temperature qubits, ones that work at maybe room temperature eventually, uh, means you won't have to have a cryostatically cooled system that's colder than the coldest place in the universe um, in order to make it operate. It'd be nice if you know, maybe one day we had a, a quantum computer in our phones. What we'll have is uh, a QPU, a quantum processing unit, rather like we have a GPU or an FPU, yeah. 13 point unit or a graphical processor, in a junk, in an adjunct to a classical processor, because there are lots of things that quantum computers can't do. So almost all algorithms will be hybrid between a classical and a quantum. So you'll do some computation on the classical side, package up your problem, send it over to the quantum computer, run one loop, get the answer back, unpack it, rinse, repeat, go around again. And so that tight coupling between classical and quantum side will be 
uh, very important. At the moment, the uh, quantum computers are accessible via the cloud through the IBM Q experience, um, which means that you can be doing some computing, then make an API call literally to send your quantum program across to the quantum computer, mm -hmm. have it computed and sent back again. So you can already do that hybrid uh, classico quantum uh, computation. So it's really exciting stuff. It's really exciting. And what, what do you think about the progress? It's like, I mean, like uh, when, when I was looking at the fridge, <laughs> Uh, and, and the style, how, how, how it looks like, to me it was something like, oh, this, is, this looks like uh, the first computers uh, in terms of the size. Uh, yeah. may, maybe even, of course, your computer has a billion more possibility of, of, of calculation power. Um, but is it something like that we are getting, I mean, like with the experience you're now doing on your research so that the things are getting... Of course, the things need to get smaller, more energy efficient, new materials for this kind of quantum, to, to get this quantum state. So um, what do you think? Is this a pro I have no doubt of the progress here. <laughs> well, I think all of those. I think in terms of miniaturization, it's actually pretty amazing already because bear in mind that just adding one qubit doubles the power of the computer. So for the high performance computing, like one rack of computers to make it twice as powerful, you have to add a second rack, which yeah. uses twice as much power. Whereas a quantum computer, you just add one more qubit inside the same box and it actually takes the same amount of power. And that's the, the chiller. Uh, so it's, it's very, very small compared with any high performance computing resource. Um, in terms of research, it's not so much miniaturizing it. I mean, I think if it fits in a box, three meters cubed uh, in a data center that's not a bad thing um, but the the skill is in making qubits that work well and this is the problem at the moment just adding qubits to a quantum system doesn't actually help because uh, all qubits have some noise associated with them and with the up down left and right links to other qubits you end up getting a multiplicative effect uh, so you get a very expensive random number generator if you're not careful uh, so simply a race for more qubits doesn't really help what we want is effective qubits, ones that are less noisy, uh, stay coherent yep. for longer, uh, execute gates more accurately with better fidelity. So we've come up with a term called quantum volume, which is a number which represents the power in some, some unitless measure of how powerful the, the quantum computer is. It's rather like Moore's law in that the, uh, we've made the prediction that we will double, we've, we've kind of claimed we'll double that number every year. And we've got four data points on that line so far this year, we've got 32. Uh, but that doesn't, isn't just a material science thing, that's uh, software and hardware and the optimizing transpiler, which converts your instructions into what actually runs as microwave pulses in the chip. Um, it, you know, there's loads of different, there's material science, there's actual, um, the manufacturing fidelity of the chips themselves, there's the testing of the chips, all sorts of things come together to make that, that quantum volume increase. So it's a whole load of different disciplines all working together to, to drive that, that progression. And that's just such an exciting so it's time. A, it's, it's a huge multidiscipline challenge. Absolutely, yeah. In our research labs in, uh, in New York, um, you know, there's all different, you know, there's the software departments, the hardware department, yeah. there's the chip designers, there's the fab plant, there's the uh, material scientists, there's the transpiler experts. It's like, wow, <laughs> everybody working on it. Yeah. Well, amazing. And, I, and I'm, I'm, um, yes, I'm, I'm looking forward to get uh, an update here and, and just, to, just, to see, just to see the progress. Andy, the thank cool, you very the much. Coolest thing, and the coolest thing is, I'll just mention that anyone can play with our quantum computer for free. It's, it, if you go to a, um, ibm.com slash quantum experience uh, you can just you can get a, an id and play with a five or 15 qubit quantum computer program it in python and uh, have a play join the quantum revolution yes this is amazing and i and i wonder how many people are just uh, doing these programs to find the answer of the universe and everything <laughs> and <laughs> well, that's quite interesting actually because we, we do a when we do a workshop the first question is um People often say that quantum computers should be able to solve the mysteries of life, the universe, and everything. So make your quantum computer display the number 42. So that's, that's the first challenge, which you can do on six qubits, uh, 101010. Zero, okay. one, zero, one, zero. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, thank you very much. It was great to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you.